Good afternoon. My name is Larry Bacow, and I have the pleasure of being president of Harvard University. It's also my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci, moderated by Dr. Sanjay Gupta. In March, when my wife Adele and I were going through the worst of our close encounter with COVID-19, which for both of us was blessedly reasonably mild, it was hard not to think about other people across the country who were fighting this disease, both at home and in hospitals, many of them separated from their friends and their loved ones. Since then, all of us have experienced profound disruptions in almost every aspect of our lives. And most of us have come to know someone who's either lost a friend or a loved one uh, to this disease. At the same time, this disease has laid bare gross inequities in our healthcare system. Uh, and not just in our healthcare system, but also in our system of justice, um, which has helped us to understand and awoken many of us to the day-to-day -day indignities and overt structural racism that our black friends and colleagues face in this country on a daily basis. Our society is in so many ways at a tipping point. There's so much that we need to do right now. And there's, there's one thing that we need most of all, and that is voices of conviction, voices of reason to help guide us through these difficult times. Today, we bring to you a conversation between two such voices. And there's no better host for this than the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. As Dean Williams says, it will take more than just monetary investment in our country to see positive change. We must also, and here I'm quoting her directly, invest with our hearts. Thank you, Dean Williams, for making the investment of time and attention possible for all of us. I hope everyone finds this conversation to be enlightening. And thank you to Drs. Fauci and Gupta uh, for participating in it with us today. President Bacow, thanks so much for your welcoming remarks. All of us here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health are deeply grateful for your support. Engaging from the heart is something those of us in public health are quite accustomed to. We come together to improve the lives of the entire world. Our goals are enormous and our struggles at times are heavy. Yet when public health works, our impact extends far and wide and becomes deeply embedded in our culture and our history. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to When Public Health Means Business, a conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci, moderated by Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and presented in partnership with the New England Journal of Medicine. How did it come to this? That was the lead of Ed Young's brilliant coronavirus article in The Atlantic earlier this week. He captured the exact sentiments those of us in public health have been struggling with for months. How did it come to this? Ed continued in his article, a virus a thousand times smaller than a dust moat was humbled, has humbled and humiliated the planet's most powerful nation. America has failed to protect its people. Those words have touched a, word, a nerve in me. They've even haunted me. And I wondered, has public health failed? Or have those in education, government, and policy failed public health? Believe me, there are no simple answers. But we do know this, we are in the middle of one of the worst public health crises this country has ever seen. And many factors that got us to this point must change. No longer can the days of underfunding, underinvesting in public health continue. No longer can we endure the attacks on science. And no longer can we accept racial injustice and racial health disparities as part of the status quo. Think about it. Vaccines, birth control, hand washing. The greatest advances in human health in the last century have come from public health. 
When public health operates on all cylinders, it not only benefits everyone, it saves lives, it extends lives, and it improves the quality of lives. Many have written about this public health moment, but public health is not just a moment. It is an enduring movement that deserves respect and support on a massive scale. Investing in a robust, innovative public health system will yield results for decades to come and will undoubtedly lead us out of this current crisis. The crucial part? The crucial part here is we all must be a part of this mission. With that, I'd like to welcome and thank Drs. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Sanjay Gupta for continuing this conversation with us. Sanjay, over to you, my friend. And thanks Dean again. Williams. Dean Williams, thank you uh, very much. What an honor to be here. Uh, such an important conversation. I got to say, I completely agree with you as well that science does, science does have, they, it has to lead us forward. We have to pay attention to it. We're going to explore the science of this pandemic today, as well as the complexity of the current moment in which all of this is happening in order to sort of understand what some semblance of normalcy will look like and hopefully provide some hope as well uh, to people. And I also want to say, I think there's no better environment than an academic environment like this one to have a conversation like this. Uh, and we have some great uh, questions that are coming in from all over. We're going to get to those. But first, let me uh, introduce uh, the man of the hour. We're honored to be joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the NIAID, as you all know. He's going to be taking questions from Facebook and Zoom, but also from the distinguished faculty at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It's also uh, streaming on CNN.com for people that want to watch that there. So go ahead and start sending in those questions. We want to, this to be as engaged and interactive as possible. Uh, this is the latest installment for Harvard of When Public Health Means Business. Dr. Fauci, welcome. Thank you, Sanjay. It's great to be here. And thank you, Dean Williams. Real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I got I got um, I have so much to ask you every time we get together and you're so generous with your time when I call you and I and I appreciate that there's so much uh, that people want to know but let me just ask for a second how are how are you doing I, I know that it's been a very long six months uh, you've been you've been doing just amazing work tirelessly how are you you know in general Sanjay I'm fine um, I'm um, adjusted to what's called just chronic exhaustion. Um, I think one of the good things about having done my internship and residency during a period of time when we were on every other night and every other weekend before those rules were changed, I think this is my internship on steroids here. Is what it is. So I, I'm doing fine. Uh, uh, so I, I can't complain. I think the energy and the adrenaline rush and the focus comes from what you said, the importance of the problem and what the Dean and the President said, that this is a historic situation we're facing. So we've just got to focus in on our jobs and worry about relaxing later, but not now for sure. And I should point out, you were seeing patients uh, earlier today. You're still staying clinically active. I am as well. It is one of the great joys of continuing to be able to practice medicine. You, you have told me and you've told others that you have no intention of not staying in this job as, as tough as it's been, frankly, lately. So let me ask the question a little bit differently uh, because you and I also share, we both have wives and three daughters. Um, how's Christine doing with all this? Has she, uh, has she worried about you? Does she suggested that maybe you pull back at all? Well, she doesn't suggest I pull back. She's fine. The girls are fine. They're geographically distributed. They're young women now and have their own jobs and their own professions. They're in three separate cities. So I, I miss seeing them. The only stress, I think more on the children. Uh, Chris is a, is a rock. She's my anchor. Is the, 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 the really uh, unseemly things that crises bring out in the world. You know, it brings out the best of people and the worst of people. And, you know, getting death threats for me and my family and, harassing my daughters to the point where I have to get security is just, I mean, it's amazing. I, I wouldn't have imagined in my wildest dreams that people who object to things that are pure public health principles are so set against it and don't like what you and I say, uh, namely in the word of science, that they actually threaten you. I mean, that to me is just strange. So 
Other than that, which they're handling well, I wish that they did not have to go through that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you're, you're going through that and your daughters and Christine, I, I, I know it can't be easy. Dean Williams refer, referred to this war on science. Dr. Fauci, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but you are the face of science for so many right now, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Um, but I am sorry that you're, you're going through that. There just, there, there isn't an excuse for that. We have a public health crisis uh, through which you're helping us navigate uh, ourselves. And let's get to that. Let's, I wanna show this animation here of what's been going on in the world with regard to COVID uh, in several countries around the world. And you get an idea if you look at this timetable, obviously things started off in China, we're in middle March there, and then the United States just sort of takes over there. Dr. Fauci, as you can see, I think you can see this graphic, this will take us up to August 5th. As Dean Williams sort of asked, how did, how did we get here? You know, uh, as she also said, it's such a complicated situation, Sanjay, of how we got here. First of all, we got hit really hard by a historic pandemic that has characteristics that make it very difficult, even under the best of circumstances, to respond adequately. And that is a, an outbreak of a virus that has extraordinary unprecedented capability of transmitting efficiently from human to human. You know, when viruses jump from an animal host to a human, uh, as we've seen with the original SARS, which we're able to contain by public health measures, or with the bird flu, which jumped to human, but had no capability of really going from human to human. We now have one that jumped from an animal, uh, in this case, a bat, certainly, and then maybe an intermediate host that, that evolved and developed an extraordinary capability of spreading from human to human. So that by the time you really got your arms around this, you had penetration into the community and every country has suffered. We, the United States, has suffered as, as worse or, or, you know, as much or worse than anyone. I mean, when you look at the number of infections and the number of deaths, it really is, is, is quite, uh, quite concerning. And again, the factors that got us there, we can go over one by one. I don't think I, I'd have to give a soliloquy here to go through them. So no, I, I, the questions. I understand, yeah. sir. I, and I think that the idea that this is a very contagious virus uh, is, is true. I think uh, that graphic is really meant to show the United States sort of comparison to the rest of the world. And I realize that there's a lot in there, but when you say we're one of the worst, it is worth reminding people we're not quite 5% of the world's population, yet represent 20 to 25% of the world's infections cumulatively, 20 to 25% of the world's deaths as well. I mean, we're, that, that, that has to be the worst. Is it not the worst? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is quantitatively, if you look at it, it is. I mean, the numbers don't lie. But let, let, let's, let's get to some questions right away, and we'll keep coming back to this topic. Uh, 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 Dr. Arnie Epstein has a question specifically that relates to this. Dr. Fauci, the title of this series is When Public Health Means Business. And thus far, it seems like we haven't meant business at all. The United States has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's COVID cases and deaths. For a country that is the most affluent and influential, that is a catastrophe. My question is, knowing what you now know, what would you do differently before the next pandemic or during it? Well, I, I think there's two parts of that question, sir. One is, you know, how we, how we might explain how this happened and what I would do different, and then what you would do different for the next pandemic. I think preparedness, we put together a pandemic preparedness plan as we were trying to respond to the threat of the pre-pandemic bird flu back in 2005. And again, it was a plan that was a reasonable plan. And in fact, when it was evaluated independently by Johns Hopkins, it stated that it was our preparedness for a pandemic was essentially number one in the world. But what happened when the rubber hit the road on this and we did get hit we had the kind of response that was not as well suited to what the dynamics of this outbreak is. And what happened is that we had a bit of a disparate response. We, we live in a very big country 
And we often leave the decisions about the implementation of things at the local level. And what we've seen is a great disparity in how individual states, cities, et cetera, responded. The critical issue that I think we need to look at how we can get that down is that when you look at the curves and it relates to Sanjay's graph, that when we went up and then started to come down, everybody got hit badly. China got hit badly. Europe, particularly Italy, France, and Spain, when they went up and they responded, they came all the way down to a baseline so that when they started to reopen their countries in a very careful way, they had to deal with little blips that could easily be controlled. When you looked at our curve, it's telling. And that's the thing that bothers me. We went way up and when we came down, we came down to a plateau of 20,000 cases per day. That is not a good baseline. We needed to get further down so that as we went along over weeks and months, we stayed at 20,000 per day. Some parts of the country did very well. They came up and they came way down. Other parts of the country held it so they didn't even go up. But there were so many different players, as it were, in the country that the totality of the country, that some net of that was a flat line that was very high. And then when we decided with the guidelines of how we can open America again, for reasons that we obviously couldn't stay shut down forever, it was having terrible economic consequences, terrible consequences on employment, we decided we would try to take steps to open. And when we did, we didn't do it uniformly. Some states did not pay attention to the, um, the benchmarks or the checkpoints. Others did it fine, but the citizenry within a state or within a city actually did an all and none phenomenon. They said, we're locked down, so now we're just gonna let it fly. Now you could say, no, that didn't happen, but the numbers tell you what happened. Because what happened is that as we began to open, we went from 20,000 a day to 30, 40, 50, 60, and we even peaked at 70,000 new infections. The deaths had gone down nicely. That was good. Now they're starting to go up because of the cases that went up. So we had a disparate response. We didn't all row together. We had some went up and some went down. And there are parts of the country you could look at that did very well. But totally, as a nation, we are in that situation where we've got to get that control way down to a low baseline. So, so Dr. Fauci, let me just, it's summarizing, we were ill-prepared to deal with this pandemic in the first place, sounds like. And then you call the response sort of a disparate response, but it sounds like it was a failed response. We never really fully implemented a therapy. I mean, in medicine, if you give a half a therapy, you wouldn't call it you know, a disparate therapy. You would say you gave inadequate therapy to, to actually treat the problem. Did, did we let the American people down with this response? You know, Sanjay, you know <laughs> that if I make a statement that we let the American people down, it would be distracting because that would be the sound bite. And I wouldn't want to get the message that I'm trying to get across where I think we can handle this if we have some fundamental principles that I hope, and I know you'll let me, get the, uh, the, the opportunity to articulate because we can do much better and we can do much better without locking down. And I think the, that, that strange binary of, uh, approach that either you lock down or you let it all fly. There's some place in the middle when we can open the economy and still avoid these kind of surges that we're seeing. And I hope we get a chance to discuss that. Well, maybe we can get right to that now, sir. You, you made a list the other day, and I'll just uh, rattle them off for the audience. Uh, if, if we wore masks, if we kept physical distance, if we uh, uh, shut down bars or at least indoor closely crowded situations, large gatherings, and washed hands often. And if outdoors, those five things. Than, and outdoors, much better than indoors, always. That's if, the point. If we did those five things, that's not shutting down, but right. if we did those five things, what would the country look like in three or four weeks? 
you know, I, it may take a little bit longer than three or four weeks. I'd say what it would look like in a month and a month and a half. I think it would be the kind of turnaround that when, you know, the, the, the southern states that got hit really badly, you know, were Southern California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida. What Arizona did is that they finally did say, wait a minute, we're in trouble. We're going to institute those fundamental principles. And they came right down in a nice curve, which is really good. So here's the point that I want to make is that, and, and it seems simple, is that one of the things working against it, the good news about COVID-19 is that about 40% of the population has no symptoms when they get infected. That's good. I mean, you get infected, you get no symptoms. The bad news for messaging is that 40% of the population get no symptoms. Because if you want to get a unified response with this most unusual virus, Sanjay, I don't, I don't think anything has come close to that in my 40 years of experience. You get 40% of the people have no symptoms. Then you get some people that get minor symptoms, some that get serious enough that they're in bed for several weeks, and they even have some residual effects that I hope we can talk about later. Then there are those that require hospitalization, some intensive care, some ventilation, and some death. So that if you look at the population as a whole, to get a unified message that everybody understands, you have some people who they know statistically, it's not going to bother them individually as a person, because the chances are they're not going to get symptoms. And even if they do, they're going to be mild. Then you get others, the ones that we've spoken about on your show a lot, the elderly, those with underlying conditions, even young people with underlying conditions, who it is a significant threat of serious disease and death. So if you wanted to get control over it, it would be nice if everybody was singing from the same tune when you want to get it down. But what's happened, Sanjay? Look at the reality. What has happened is that we have a situation where we say, open up in a measured, prudent way. Yeah. And you get some that do it fine. And then you see the pictures of people at bars with no masks, not social distancing. I'm not blaming them because I think they're doing that innocently. Because what they're saying incorrectly is that if I get infected, I'm in a vacuum. It doesn't bother anybody else. I'm not bothering them. Don't bother me. That's incorrect, because even though you are likely not going to get symptoms, you are propagating the outbreak, which yeah. means that you're going to infect someone who will infect someone who then will have a serious consequence. So let me get to what I think is the major point. I was trying to think about some sort of a metaphor or analogy to kind of get people to understand. And you mentioned my daughters, as I think I've bragged about to you once. One of my daughters was a pretty good varsity crew member at a, at a division one college. And there are eight people on the boat. And the thing I learned, I knew nothing about crew, but the thing I learned when watching every one of their meets was that you have eight people. The only way you're going to win the race is that when all eight are rowing in unison, you get one that catches a crab as it were, where the oar goes that way or don't row you don't win. So as long as you have any member of society, any demographic group who's not seriously trying to get to the end game of suppressing this, it will continue to smolder and smolder and smolder. And that will be the reason why in a non-unified way, we've plateaued at an unacceptable level. Now, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but I think that's the problem. So I, we, we will keep this, this line of conversation going because I think it does then raise the question, if we can't get to that point where people, either because of trust or because of diligence with these basic public health measures, if it just isn't happening, do we need to do something that's more aggressive in this country? And before you answer, think about that. This, this feeds into our next question from Dr. Sarah Fortune. So let's play that as well. Over the past several months, I've spent a great deal of time talking to the community, to the lay press about 
um, the COVID pandemic and uh, advances in SARS-CoV-2 research. And I know you have done the same times 10. I have been disheartened by threads of mistrust um, in the public um, towards uh, science. Uh, I have received questions about um, uh, the legitimacy of scientific studies and the potential political motivations of the scientists conducting those studies. Um, and uh, I am in sort of despair about the state of relations between the scientific community and the public. And I was wondering if there are lessons that you have learned about um, building trust between the scientific community and the public um, that could help us move forward now. You know, that's a very good question, uh, Sanjay, and a very good comment. Uh, yes, there is a degree of anti-science feeling in this country. Um, and I think it is not just related to science, it's almost related to authority and a mistrust in authority that spills over because in some respects, scientists, because they're trying to present data, may be looked at, looked upon as being authoritative figure. And the pushing back on authority is pushing back on government is the same as pushing back on science. Unfortunately, that's not what scientists are. And I think we need to be more transparent and reaching out to people and engaging society and understanding why science and evidence-based policy is so important. But the, the, the person who just made that comment is absolutely correct. That is really a very difficult thing to do. And I know when I say that if we follow these five or six principles, we can open up. We, we don't have to stay shut. We can push and open up if we do this. There are some people that just don't believe me or don't pay attention to that. And that's unfortunate because that is the way out of this. We can continue to go towards normality without doing the drastic things of shutting down if we follow some fundamental principles. Just because we're talking about things happening real time and trying to look to the future and I, and I want to be optimistic about this, as do you, Dr. Fauci, but we've tried this, and I think you've made the case about the benefit of these, these simple public health measures. I've made the case that, look, these basic public health measures have helped eradicate diseases off the face of the earth, and yet we're still not doing it in this country. Right. So just in the interest of where are we going, what do we have to do? If that doesn't happen over the next few weeks, do you think we'll have to go into shutdown mode? I, I don't think we have to go into shutdown mode, um, Sanjay. I am, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. I do have um, a, an abiding faith in, in the American spirit. And, and I, that's the reason why I, I invest the time and I love being on with you at, in any forum because we can start talking about the science. And the more we give a consistent message the more people are going to start to understand what we need to do. I, I think the most part, we've been through some terrible times. And once you realize that everybody's in it together, uh, you know, wh when we had 9-11, everyone was frightened, particularly because we had anthrax after that. And that's how yeah. I got involved with it. And you and I spent a lot of time on TV talking about that. When that happened, everybody felt threatened. So there was this kind of synergy among different demographic groups about hold together as a nation. Now, there's such a divergence of how people view this and such a divisiveness that has now crept into the political. Remember a little while ago, you know, it depends on whether you wear a mask on how you feel politically, which was completely ridiculous because a mask is a public health tool. It doesn't make any difference. And yet we've gotten into this. So the atmosphere that we're in right now is not conducive to, you know, to the kinds of things you're talking about. I, I, I do want to talk about the, the certainty by which we speak of things. You know, I, I was making a comment to someone the other day, Dr. Fauci, that uh, um, science, uh, like health science, public health is not like math. It's not two plus two equals four. 
there is a process by which we arrive at conclusions and things like that. So when you talk about these five things, wearing the mask, the physical distancing, avoiding large crowds, et cetera, how confident are you that those strategies would work? Yeah, well, good. <laughs> That's the good question. And I think you're leading up to something that we've discussed a lot uh, over, the, over the months and years, um, <laughs> yeah. Andre. And that is, I mean, the, the scientific process is one that's inherently self-correcting because you look at data at a given time, you make a decision, a policy, a recommendation, a guideline, whatever you want to say based on that. But the true nature of science is that particularly when you're in an evolving situation, you've got to be flexible enough and humble enough to say, you know, two months or three months down the line, we're starting to see a different set of data and a different set of facts that we may want to modify a bit the kinds of decisions and recommendations that we make. It can't be, if we were in a completely static situation, the facts wouldn't change. I mean, it just doesn't change. But we have uncharted territory where we have something brand new, historic, nothing like it in 102 years, and it's evolving. Right. So as it evolves, that's when you make your, your recommendation. And particularly things like masks and crowd, indoor, outdoor, aerosol, not aerosol. These are things that we're learning as time goes by, and you do the best you can to make the recommendation based on the data that you have right now. We, we do this thing at the beginning of the town halls that you've been so kind to join us at called what we know and what we don't know. Let me just tick through a couple basic science questions. Uh, we know this is a virus, correct? Correct. Do we know this is a novel coronavirus? Novel meaning unique, something the world hasn't seen before. Yeah, well, we know the class of virus it is, it's a coronavirus. So the world has seen coronaviruses before, but if you look at the incredible data bank you have and go in, you could see that this virus was not in humans, was evolving in bats to a point where it was very close, likely jumped to an intermediate host, and now it's in humans. So I am certain that from what we know now of the data that's available, that we've never seen this virus before. We've seen coronaviruses, as you know, coronaviruses, the benign ones, the four that cause human common cold have been around forever, and they cause anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of all the common colds that you and I get every year. But this one is new. There was some recent literature about the fact that there was evidence of T cell reactivity in 40 to 50 percent of these people who were studied, their blood samples were studied. T cell reactivity, part of the immune system. If people have not been exposed to this virus before, how could they have this T cell reactivity? And is that a, is that a good thing? I mean, is that, is that potentially immunity? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you what we do know and tell you what we hopefully will find out because we're gonna start looking at this. Yes, T cell immunity has a degree of specificity or even lack of so that you could have been exposed to coronavirus is the way you and I for sure were exposed to. And you could develop antibodies that likely will diminish over time, but you would have T cell memory there that could likely cross react with the current coronavirus. If that's true, Sanjay, now you gotta get into the realm of, are there T cells that recognize coronavirus? Fact, yes. Do those T cells protect you mm -hmm. against the coronavirus we're facing? I don't know, <laughs> but we're gonna try and find out because it is likely that if they really do recognize epitopes on this particular virus, it could explain why some people, particularly children who might be closer to the response of the common cold coronavirus, why they may be not getting ill. Now, how do you do that? You screen a whole bunch of children and you find out if they have these T cells more than adults. So that's one in which you can make a reasonable assumption 
but you don't declare it a fact until you get the data. And that's what we want to do. Along those lines, there's clearly been some data now on who is most vulnerable to getting sick uh, or even dying from this. People who are elderly, people who have certain pre-existing conditions. And yet there are these stories, as you know, Dr. Fauci, of, of young people seemingly otherwise healthy, uh, maybe not kids, but in their 30s and 40s, not vulnerable patients, who, who also get very sick all of a sudden. And, and I mean, need the ventilator, need to be on ECMO, uh, all of this. Is it, still, is it still random or do you have any better idea as to why some of these other patients get so sick? Yeah, uh, the answer is we have some clear idea and there's still some things that are unknown. So in, in the typical biological world that you and I live in, there's the famous bell-shaped curve, okay? So if the big part of the bell is the people you know have a higher degree of likelihood of a serious outcome, the elderly and those with the underlying conditions that we know so well, predominantly diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, et cetera. They have a much higher likelihood. You look at the data, the data nails that down. 90 plus percent of the people who die are over a certain age. Then you get the people on the tails of the bell-shaped curve. And that is the people who are young, seemingly healthy, and we're seeing more and more of them who get a serious outcome to the point that they get hospitalized and sometimes die. I have to tell you without any name, I have even close to me in the brother of a, of a very close relative of mine was a 32 year old young man, vibrant man, otherwise healthy, got a typical coronavirus infection, got symptoms, developed a cardiomyopathy and died. That happens. That just happens. It isn't the, 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 the majority by any means, because if you look at the, the bar graphs that you're familiar with, where you look at the hospitalization per 100,000, and you look at the age, it goes like this, where it's hundreds per 100,000 when you're an elderly individual, and it's like four to five when you get down here. There's no doubt, but that doesn't mean that there are individuals there who are not gonna suffer like the person I'm referring to. However, we don't know why. I mean, if the person had diabetes or obesity, good explanation. But some people are otherwise perfectly normal. Is that a genetic thing? Don't know. Is that a big expression of ACE2 receptors in their airway and in their lungs? Could be, we don't know yet. And that's where, where I say, um, Sanjay, we've gotta be humble that we don't know. We can give the possibilities, but we don't know. These things that we talk about like this, and this will come up a couple more times, are they knowable and we just don't know yet? This gets back to the intricacies of science. Again, when you say this 34, and I'm sorry to hear about your friend's brother, I, I have a friend, uh, a nurse that I know as well, 34 years old, who, who died. And, and the question that comes up, I think, from families, obviously, and people, was there any way to have known, uh, predict? You're saying no at this point, we don't know, but is it knowable? Will we know at one point that 30 year old, despite all their other fine medical history, is vulnerable to this disease? You know, it could be genetic. It could be, we know from good studies that there are certain infections that some individuals can lead a perfectly normal life so long as they don't come into contact with a particular my uh, particular pathogen. It isn't every pathogen, you know, and I know, and probably many of the viewers, that if you have a true immunodeficiency, there are multiple infections yeah. that you are susceptible to. But there are some genetic polymorphisms where you have a defect that would never bother you at all unless you came into contact with a particular virus, like a herpes okay. virus or whatever, and then all hell breaks loose. It could be that, and we could find that out with enough clinical experience. Let's get to another question. This one is coming from Professor Joe Allen at the School of Public Health. I've been writing about airborne transmission in healthy buildings as the first line of defense for coronavirus since February. Having done forensic investigations of sick buildings, there were telltale signs from the cruise ship, Biogen outbreaks, that 
airborne transmission was happening. And we had examples from SARS and MERS that airborne spread could happen. Basically to me, we knew enough to act even at that time. And there seemed little downside in taking precautions like higher ventilation rates and filtration. Every piece of evidence since then has supported this hypothesis. In fact, experts in my field wrote a letter to the WHO, 239 of us. Why do you think CDC and WHO have been so reluctant to acknowledge airborne transmission? Do you think airborne transmission is happening? If so, are you a proponent of including healthy building strategies like enhanced ventilation and filtration in the suite of control measures people should take, including mask wearing, hand washing, and distancing? And thanks for your work. Well, <laughs> great question. I'm glad he's one of the signatures of that, of that uh, letter that was sent. This is, this is an area that right now I have brought this myself to the task force to really take a really good look at this. And what that the individual was saying is something again about the humbleness of science. Hmm. We were always hearing that the six foot distance saying that if you have a particle that's greater than five micrometers, it's likely gonna fall down. If you have one that's less than five micrometers, then you can get aerosol floating. That was embedded in the literature until some very smart, and I'm gonna be on a conference call with them in the next couple of days, maybe tomorrow, I don't know, um, write to me and say, these are people who make a living with the physics of particle and aerosolization. Not reading the literature, this is what they do. Hmm. And they say, you know, you really better take a, a bigger look at this because from what we know about particle physics and air flows, that there may be droplets that are much larger than five micrometers that continue to go around, which means it gives you some pause to think about do we know what to do and should we investigate and make some changes exactly what that individual was saying? What about, I mean, it gives you a greater reason for wearing a mask at all times, but it also tells you that outdoors will likely be much better than indoors. That when you are indoors, you've really got to look at what the circulation is and should you be doing things like filtering with HEPA filters. These are things that are unknown now, but that we are going to address because it's something that has always been kind of hanging out there without really understanding the role of aerosol. And importantly, um, Sanjay, exactly what aerosol is. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we are, we're going with a definition of a particle size and then you get people who really know what they're talking about. Tell us, wait a minute, you got to relook at that because it isn't what you think. So I'm going to, not me personally, yes, me personally, but with the team at the task force, are going to really take a careful look at that. Coming back to this point that we're, we keep hitting on, the, the pace of science and how we know something is conclusive. Um, maybe because I'm a surgeon, I get impatient, but take something like this issue. Shouldn't we know this by now? Whether this is an aerosolized, potentially aerosolized virus versus just something that spreads via droplets? I mean, it seems like you could, we could, you know, given that we're in the middle of the worst public health crisis and that's such a salient central point, why don't we already know the answer? You know, we, it's, it's not an easy answer to get because you can talk about uh, droplets that hang around. The question is, you've got to do a study to show that the virus actually transmits that way. And when you do it, you got to do it in a BSL-3 facility of which there are limited amounts. So right now, as we're speaking, even before I got on, we're on the phone with all the different groups of saying, here's an important question. We better answer it and we better answer it quickly. However, it's not going to change much. What it tells me that if this is true, that aerosol plays a much greater role than we think, then for goodness sakes, the five or six things that I mentioned in the beginning of this discussion are in spades what you've got to do. You've got to wear a mask. You've got to avoid crowds. Outdoor better than indoor. All the same stuff. It also makes a, a strategy with regard to ventilation inside right. buildings, especially as we're thinking about kids going back to school. Uh, if we have the answer to this aerosolization question, let's just assume it is yes. 
right. uh, that it is aerosolized, can be aerosolized. What does that mean then for indoor buildings uh, as kids go back to school? Do these special filters, right. such as these HEPA filters, have to be in place? Well, you know, those are things that are actually being discussed. But the one thing you can do is to try and say as best as possible is that particularly if you're in a climate where you can do it, keep the windows open. I mean, that to me, when you're dealing with a respiratory virus, its simplicity is so, so obvious that people don't pay attention to it. Like, you mean telling me we got this big crisis and you're telling me to open up a window? Yes, I'm telling you to open up the window. Let's, let's we keep going with another line of thinking here. This is a question from Professor Mary Bassett. Dr. Fauci, before I get to my question, I just want to say a couple of things. One is how relieved and proud we all are that you continue to navigate the corridors of power in defense of the public's health. As you know, we have documented very large racial disparities in the occurrence of COVID-19, both in infection rates and in mortality. A lot's been said about comorbidities, but much less has been said about exposure. And of course, in public health, our main interest is always in what we call primary prevention or reducing exposure. Could you talk a little bit about that? By this, I mean exposure at home, exposure while getting to work, and exposure at work if you have to continue to work outside of your home. Thank you, Mary. It's great, great to see you again, but Mary and I were and continue to be colleagues. Great to see you again, Mary. Thank you for the question. So I, when I talk about the, the, the racial and ethnic disparities among minorities, including in particular African-Americans, Latinx, and Native Americans, there, I, I call it um, a double negative disparity. First of all, whether or not you have a greater chance of getting infected. One does not like to ever, ever generalize when you're dealing with ethnic demography, racial demography. But the fact is that the likelihood that an African-American or a Latinx has a job that would require their being in a risk situation is greater than those of us who have a job where I can talk to a computer and be completely safe from getting the kinds of exposures. They are part of the workforce that comes into contact with people. So right from the get-go, you have the, the, the likelihood, much more than others, of getting infected. The second part of this double negative whammy that I call it is that because of the social determinants of health that have been decades and decades in the making, that African-Americans and other minorities have a much greater incidence and prevalence of the underlying conditions that lead to a severe outcome. And those are the ones that are so familiar because we as physicians see it all the time. Diabetes, hypertension, obesity, renal disease, cardiovascular disease, those are the kind of things that make that death rate very high in that group. And if you look at the disparities that Mary was talking about, I mean, if you look at the hospitalization per 100,000, then African-Americans are at least five times what whites and Caucasians are in hospitalizations, all other parameters being equal. And it's because of that that, we're, that we get these extraordinary disparities. Now, you can do something about the immediate and you need a commitment, a decades long commitment looking forward to getting rid of the others. The things we can do now is to make sure we get things like testing availability and availability to get immediately into care in those areas, those regions, those counties, those cities that are overrepresented with the demographic group that's at risk. We can do that right now. We have an obligation. And in fact, as part of the NIH's Rad X that you're familiar with, Sanjay, because mm -hmm. I know you've spoken about it on your program, that there's an underserved population of UP down there in which we're trying to create the infrastructure that we get these diagnostics to these individuals so they can get diagnosed quickly and get into care quickly. It's 
a question about testing that comes up quite a bit. And I can tell you, again, as I mentioned, I got three girls who are going back to school uh, and there's lots of questions about testing at their school, should it happen? Uh, we talked, you and I, uh, a few months ago about needed breakthroughs in testing. Leaving aside the numbers for a second of tests that we need, what, what does a breakthrough in testing look like? Uh, you're testing for the virus. Can you get a breakthrough that allows widespread testing that is rapid, that is accurate, that is actionable in some way? And, and if so, why aren't we there yet? Yeah, you know, that's, you just described it perfectly, uh, Sanjay. That's exactly what we need. And that's exactly what, you know, I have been pushing for for some time yeah. right now. As you know, I've spoken to you about this, both publicly and privately. We don't have it yet. Uh, I hope now with the investment that has been made about really getting point of care that have the characteristics you're talking about, in the perfect world, which I think we can get there, we're a rich country, we've done amazing things, to get a test that is very specific, because right now you have tests that you want to determine if an individual is infected for contact tracing. The weakness of that is though, although in some areas it's doing fine, in others, the gap between the time you get the test yeah. and the time you get the result in some respects, omic obviates the reason why you did the test. Because if you have five to seven days, we've got to correct that. But we've got to do even much better than that. The ultimate goal is that you would have a test that you could do and get a result in 10 minutes that's sensitive, specific, and can be upscaled in the sense of you can do it any place and anywhere where you could have schools and working places where you could tell somebody's infected or not. Now, obviously, people will say, well, if you're not infected now, do you know tomorrow? You're not, mm -hmm. that's true, that's absolutely true. But it would still be good from a surveillance standpoint to get your arms around what the totality of infection is. Right now, what we're trying to do to decompress the load, and we were talking about this just today, on a phone call and yesterday at the, at the task force meeting is to get surveillance testing done in a way that you don't absolutely need to crowd out the testing that you need to know tomorrow whether someone's infected. When you're doing surveillance, like you need to know in the general population, you can give it to universities, get them get their tests activated and decompress the demand when you get a surge of infections, will you need to do contact tracing? Right. If we do that, I think we can get those days down. But what we ultimately need is what you just proposed. You know, and I, and I don't want to keep uh, belaboring this point, but you know, one does have to ask, why don't we have it yet? If this is doable, I'm not asking for a fantasy here, but I got to tell you, Dr. Fauci, I made this case to uh, Admiral Draw the other day, I was in the operating room this past Monday. I got a CAT scan on my patient. I got coagulation numbers on my patient. I got a cardiac echo on my patient. I was doing brain surgery on this patient, could not get a COVID result. Right. As a result, we all had to put on N95 masks, use up PPE, which is also hard to get, put ourselves at increased risk. A COVID test, right. even within this situation, why, why so many months don't we have the situation you just described? You know, um, Sanji, I could bend myself into a pretzel trying to get out of that question. It's unacceptable, period. And I don't know why, because that's not what I do every day, but I can tell you they're trying, but they're not, I mean, obviously, again, when you say something like that, it gets distorted. You are a, 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 a real world example of why we've got to do better. I mean, to say, and I know I've been in situations like that, I can get things done medically so fast, it'll spin your head. There you were in the operating room having to put on PPE because you didn't know what you're paying. I mean, that is totally unacceptable. And for me to say anything different is distorting reality. Well, well I appreciate that. And you know, I'm not trying to Put you in a tough spot. It just it, it just does boggle my mind. I think, as was said by one of our previous questioners, we're this incredible country. We do so many things so well, 
and yet with this, for some reason to me, it seems like we did not focus on it. I don't know what the motivation was for that. Uh, you don't either, I, I realize. Let's get to another question. This one about vaccines, something you do know a lot about. This is uh, Professor Mark Lipsitch. Dr. Fauci, thank you for your service in these extraordinary times. My question is about vaccines and how we'll understand their function uh, following clinical trials. In order to use a vaccine well, it's important to know whether it protects against infection and whether it protects uh, people in the most high risk groups against severe disease. But trials will probably uh, be accomplished at a point where, where those questions are somewhat uncertain even after the overall efficacy is demonstrated. What steps are being taken to try to answer those important questions that help us to decide how to use a vaccine once it's approved? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks a lot. It's good to see you. Um, so the answer to that question is that, you know, we have about six or so vaccines that the federal government is playing a direct or indirect role in, either by facilitating the testing, doing common DSMDs, et cetera, et cetera. The studies that just started G July 27th, last week, were phase three trial of two candidates, the Moderna and Pfizer, we're going to get the other companies going to come soon into phase three trial in the subsequent months. But to Mark's question that we are making a, a concerted effort to recruit a diversity of people with regard to the group that he's saying. We just started a few days ago. I get a report every morning with a pie chart of less than you know 18 to, to 65, otherwise well, 18 to 65 with a risk, greater than 65 with or without a risk. So since the trial, Sanjay, is gonna have 30,000 people, 15,000 in experimental limb, 15,000 in the placebo, if we keep getting this kind of distribution, also paying attention to racial and ethnic diversity representation, which we absolutely need, I think we can answer Mark's question and know in subgroups, whether it's just like we knew with influenza, how effective would it be in the elderly versus people 18 to 55? How effective is it in someone who's immunosuppressed versus someone who doesn't have an underlying condition? That's one of the reasons why we wanted 30,000 people in this trial to get all of that information. Operation Warp Speed is making bets, I think, as you sort of described in a few different vaccines, uh, sort of trying to get ahead of the game, possibly even manufacturing vaccines ahead of time in case one of them is promising. Who, who is making those decisions? These are big decisions, multi-billion dollar decisions. Is that the FDA that's saying, okay, we're looking at this data and it looks really promising, so we're gonna make a bet here. Here's other data, that doesn't look so promising. Because I've looked at all these studies, and frankly, while they're coming in at different times, they all say, hey, look, we're producing plenty of neutralizing antibodies, side effect profile is such and such. Who is making these, these big decisions in terms of gambling on which vaccines they're going to get behind? Okay, so there, there, there are two components there. There's an organization called ACTIVE, which is co-led uh, uh, by... Uh, Francis Collins from the NIH and, and Paul Stoffels uh, from J&J. &J. And that group gets a public-private partnership. So it doesn't look like it's just the government doing this and mm -hmm. goes through a prioritization of the kinds of things that we would ultimately study. Operation Warp Speed is a collaboration between the Department of Defense and the Department of HHS. That's a governmental organization that's led by two individuals, Monsef Slawi and a General Perna, who are the operational leaders of that. And it's divided into three groups of how do you actually operationalize the vaccine trials, the therapeutic trials, and the diagnostics. Right. So the prioritization, Sanjay, comes from a public-private partnership that makes those kinds of decisions based on the data that they see. Is that, are you satisfied with that process? I only ask because to me, it would seem like the FDA, who are the scientists that ultimately are responsible for evaluating 
therapeutics and vaccines, approving them would be the ones to also say, hey, here's where you make your bets. Right. Yeah. Why is it a public-private partnership? The, the FDA is heavily involved at every aspect of that. In fact, the therapeutics component of it is led by a very well-known person, Janet Woodcock, who is the former director of the Center for Drugs. Okay, let, 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 this uh, feeds in nicely to our next question from someone you know well, Professor Howard Coe. The concept of health equity, which you know so well, is a bedrock principle for us in public health. Right now through COVID, so many questions about equity that are swirling around. So my question for you is, during this crisis and going forward, how do we best ensure through policy and legislation, equitable access to testing and therapeutics and vaccines. Can you comment on that? Thank you, Howard. It's good to see your face again. <laughs> A lot of old friends on, on this. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, let's take vaccines as a prototype example. Uh, the standard way of looking at prioritizations of vaccines, particularly when there will be a period of time when vaccines are proven to be safe and effective, that you're not gonna have 300 million doses right away. So you're gonna have to prioritize who gets it first as you get more and more. The standard way of doing that is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, the ACIP, which traditionally advises the CDC, whose primary responsibility is to make the decisions and the recommendations that Howard is talking about. This time, it's being complemented by an independent group put together by the National Academy of Medicine. And that is a group that was put together and suggested by both Francis Collins and Bob Redfield, the director of the CDC. Mm. That group will make recommendations which will complement with the thought in mind of getting to where we need to be to make sure that the distribution of people who need it the most and would benefit for the most is done in an equitable way and no group is left out because they're not being represented. And, and just building on what we were talking about right before uh, Professor Dr. Koh's question, again, this idea of ultimately the vaccines that are gonna rise to the top. And as you said many times, it'll be, could be more than one. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're confident in the process by which we're getting there because, you know, we had heard at the beginning of the year, look, it'll be at least a year. Uh, if you look at the timetable of other vaccines, fast would be considered four years. And as you know, there's some vaccine hesitancy out there, Dr. Fauci. So I really want to nail down this point. You're comfortable with the process all, every step of the way, the way the data is evaluated, the bets that are being made by these organizations you mentioned, Active and Operation Warp Speed, and ultimately what we will have as a final product. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to address this very important question. You know, if, if, I, if someone came up, I wouldn't say who, with the name Warp Speed, which I think right away- turns, Full turns, science fiction. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> it turns people off thinking that it's reckless speed. It's not. The, the, the pace of it, Sanjay, relates so much more to the technological advances of the platform technologies that are being used right now. If you look back, go back a few years to SARS, we developed a vaccine for SARS. We used the DNA platform. We never had to use it because SARS disappeared back in 2002. From the time we got the sequence to the time we went into a phase one trial was 20 months. Because of a familiarity with the platform technology, from the time we got the sequence from the Chinese on January 10th to the time we started making the vaccine was five days. From the time then to the time we went into phase one was 62 days. So we truncated a lot of time, had nothing to do with safety. We haven't even gone near a person yet. It was only the technological advances. And right now the FDA is not cutting corners but they're doing things in a much more rapid, expedited way. Another way we're saving time is that we're making investments where the risk, you know, we always say we're proceeding at risk. That's also a bad terminology because people think 
you're proceeding at a risk to me. No, we're proceeding at a risk to the money because we're essentially preparing sites and even manufacturing vaccine before you know it works. So the good news is that if it works, you've saved many months. If it doesn't work, you've lost a lot of money. But we think, when they say you, I mean the federal government has lost a lot of money. And what happens then is that there's no risk to the integrity of the study and no risk to the safety of the study. That has allowed us to go into a phase three trial in at least a couple of candidates in the month of July, which would have been unheard of a decade ago. And that's the reason why when we talk about how long it takes. So let's take one of the vaccines. Mm. And we have no idea, Sanjay, whether one is better than the other right now. There may be some that are temporally ahead of the others, but, but the proof of the pudding is the need to do a randomized placebo-controlled trial. So right now, it's a prime and a boost. So we started injecting last week. 28 days, you get the boost. It's going to take about three months to get everybody enrolled, which will bring you into the fall. By the time you get a signal, my projection, which is only a projection, is that somewhere towards the end of the year, the beginning of 2021, we will know whether we have a safe and effective vaccine. I'm cautiously optimistic that we will be successful because when you look at the phase one data, it induces a level of antibody in that relatively small number of people, but it's clear the results that are at a level of antibody neutralizing that is comparable to, if not better, than convalescent plasma from someone who's recovered. And one of the tenets of vaccinology is that if your vaccine induces a response that's at least equivalent to natural infection, you don't have a guarantee, but that's a pretty good predictor of success. So although we never guarantee success, I feel cautiously optimistic we'll have that. So that's a relatively short period of time from January around to maybe December, January. And if you recall, I said on your show when you asked me, when do you think you'll have a vaccine? You asked me in January. I said about a year from now. Yeah. So if we do it, then we will have accomplished that goal. The, the, uh, the idea that some people have infections and then their antibodies are starting to wane, so they're no longer detectable. Uh, if, these, if these vaccines are creating antibody levels that are similar to natural infection, does that worry you? Well, it, 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 it's something I pay attention to for the following reason. Step one is to get protection for whatever period of time. I cannot imagine it's not going to last for a few months at least and maybe a year. The other thing that's important is that you're probably going to be getting some T-cell immunity, mm -hmm. which we discussed before, which might have a degree of memory that goes well beyond the presence of antibody in plasma. Then your second part of your question is, what happens? What do you do? If, in fact, we have a successful vaccine, that gives you protection for X amount of months, and you know the protection goes down, then boost them. There are a lot of vaccines that we take, that you and I take, that we give to our patients that you have to boost every once in a while. How often that is, not sure right now. And we are talking about a vaccine for hopefully the whole planet, going back to the uh, Professor Coe's question about equity. Let me, we have a few minutes remaining. Let me get to another question here. This is uh, from Professor Eric Rubin. Since you became director of the NIAID, you've seen a large number of epidemics, including influenza, Ebola, Zika, HIV, and now you're on your third coronavirus outbreak. Do you think that there are lessons we can take away from this that we can apply to the next epidemic? Well, Eric, there are, there are a couple of lessons. I mean, one is my answer to Sanjay's question a little while ago about you know, preparation for this, and it turned out to be an historic outbreak. Let's keep the corporate memory so that three or four years from now, when we're starting to worry about other things and we ask for resources for pandemic preparedness, 
that the corporate memory disappears and we say, well, you know, we'll worry about that later. We got to worry about the problem we have now. We will have another pandemic for absolutely certain. There's no doubt about that. The other lesson learned that is something that I've been talking about with influenza is to do prototype pathogens and say, you know, this is the third coronavirus pandemic that we've had. This is historically the worst pandemic we've had in 102 years. So instead of putting coronaviruses on the back burner, why don't we try, I say, well, I'm asking a question, I'm telling you, we're definitely going to do it, is to develop a universal coronavirus vaccine that has the specificity against all the coronaviruses. So we don't have to anticipate the next time this happens. That's a lesson that we've learned with influenza, which is why we're developing a universal influenza vaccine. And we're going to do the same thing with coronaviruses. We cannot, shame on us, if we're not prepared for the next coronavirus pandemic outbreak. I hope we do remember. I mean, sometimes it feels like our collective memories are very short. You know, we, we move on. But uh, this one, I think, will be tough to forget. Let me, as we're winding down, Dr. Fauci, you and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, you were one of my first interviews I ever did as a journalist. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it was very memorable back then. And still, our conversations are memorable now. I do have to ask, your job at the NIAID is, and I, and I mean this in the most respectful way, is there a succession plan? You talked about a next pandemic. Are you going to be with us and, and in this job at the time of the next pandemic? Well, you know, I, it's interesting because it, it could be taken two ways. I know. <laughs> my answer, I mean in the respectful way. <laughs> <laughs> my answer is I hope not because I hope the next pandemic, which will occur, we know that. We've been through that. They've always occurred. They're occurring now. will occur that I'll be long gone and you'll be fishing somewhere enjoying your retirement, or maybe not even around up with the spirits of your ancestors. But when you talk about succession planning, you know, when you have a job like this, it's tough to do succession planning within because people get picked from all different areas to come in. So I don't think you need to worry about it. I will stay in this job, Sanjay, as long, and I'm a pretty honest with myself and I got a really honest wife, as long as I'm on my top form. When I stop being top form, I'll be gone. You know, the, the name of this session, as you know, is when public health means business. All good businesses do have a succession plan. I mean, I mean this seriously, is there a number two? Is there someone who could step into the job and do what you have been doing? Yeah, oh, yeah I have a lot of really good people in-house, but the tradition is when a director of an institute steps down, retires, goes off to another job or what have you, there's a search committee that tries to pick the best person, not necessarily from within, but the best person in the country and the world. Mm -hmm. So for, there's some very good examples of that recently. You know, we had the, 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 the NBIB, the NIB, uh, with Bruce Tromberg, we got him from California. And then you have, um, we had John Lorsch who came in from Boston, uh, from Hopkins, excuse me. So it isn't like you train people beneath you. If you had to pick someone within, I got plenty of really, really good people who I've trained, who we've brought in, who are really, really good. You know some of them, you've interviewed them. Uh, Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for your, your time. Uh, thank you for your service to the country and to the world at this point. I mean that sincerely. I really cherish these conversations as uh, does the, the large community who's been watching today. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Sanjay. As always, it's great to be with you. I look forward to even more interviews coming up. Let's do it again soon, sir. Thank you. You bet. You bet.